Once again, I get to greet you. It's been quite a while. What do I hide? So, do you think? Uh, do you think these are the doers that dream? The doers that dream. Well. They've been dreaming for quite some time. We've got a, a, a nice group up here that actually has probably more history than I think the audience knows about. So we'll get into that here relatively shortly. But you know, looking at kind of the models that we have up on stage. So we have Skyscanner, uh, a global global flight platform. We have Hopper, who's a mobile-only OTA. We have eTravelEye, who's a global flight platform as well. Uh, Alok from uh, from Ixigo, who started out in search and uh, and transitioned to OTA, and we have Kei Shibata, who started Flight Search in Japan, and he's now mapping a path forward with content-led uh, and and media-led search. So we've got a nice diverse group up here, Sue Hint. Yeah, and it's interesting to look at their ages too, right? You know, with the uh, eTravelI. Really, the earliest, and then followed by Skyscanner, Travel.jp, and the two sort of you know newcomers, Hopper and Ixigo. So a great diverse panel. So so we, we, I I think the last panel had a lot of soul searching, right? You know, like what what are we doing this for and why? And so I felt like during the darkest days of the pandemic, we all asked ourselves soul searching questions. So therefore, I'm going to ask you very briefly, like. What was the biggest soul-searching question you asked yourself in the darkest days of the pandemic? So let's start with you, Mike. Um, for me, it was probably has Skyscanner gone from hero to zero, because that's kind of really what it felt like at the time. Um, we, we had a, we had our very first and our only uh, company summit uh, in January 2020, where we flew the entire business into London. Everybody from all of our offices were there, and it was very much a. Uh, an uplifting, motivational moment, and we had uh, we celebrated all the successes that we'd had, and we we got excited about the plans for the future. Two weeks later, we were in lockdown, and people stopped flying. Um, so that was you know the timing couldn't have been couldn't have been more sort of uh, poignant. Uh, so that was my question. I think was will travel ever really re re recover? Okay, but that's a soul searching. Will travel really recover? So let's let's go to Reno. Yeah, Hopper had been successful in the uh, OTA business, actually, especially after we launched the uh, uh, fintech services, right? So right now we are focused uh, on internationalizing ourselves. So this is my soul searching, pretty much. Okay, you're still soul searching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lisa. Um, well, I guess one of the questions that we all had to ask ourselves during such times was whether to seek additional financing. We didn't really know. Uh, whether the pandemic would go, in, go on for months or years. Um, we are happy that we didn't have to take on any uh, additional external capital. Um, and then on a personal level, I'd say a lot of people actually ask themselves the question of, should I stay or should I go? Um, regardless of the position, um, there have been people who uh, uh, decided to exit the travel industry during these times. Right. Okay. What about you, Alok? So I think the uh, downtime actually gave us uh, time to think about, you know, why we are here, like philosophically, but also as a business. And uh, uh, you know, this was a time where we put empathy at the core of our core values. And we said, look, we're not going to let anyone go in the team, um, even if that's suicidal after a few months. Um, and we did the same with our customers. Like We were probably, uh, in hindsight, doing something stupid, but we started refunding customers before getting the money back from the airlines. Um, and, and I think, in hindsight, that's the best thing we ever did, right? Like, like we had very low attrition in the team. Uh, we had customers coming back uh, you know, as the resurgence happened. And, and, and I think that soul searching really helped. That's brave, refunding customers before you're paid. Okay. What about you? What question did you ask yourself? Well, so, um, you know, the, the pandemic suddenly actually had a lot of time for me to actually think through the, uh, uh, not just uh, um, our company, but also the industry. So, uh, one kind of a bounding question is actually, so, is a meta search model broken or not? Well, this is kind of like a big fundamental question to all of us, maybe. And the, uh, um, um, I, I try to actually put I can the, help with that. Oh, here we go. <laughs> well, because, you know, yeah, you, you, you actually transition your business from meta search to the uh, OTA. So, and then w this, this is a really big burning question because I think that industry 
has been consolidated. Over the long, over the over the course of long years, you mean not just the pandemic, and the pandemic really accelerated the consolidation. I think so, and the uh, uh, this time really kind of reminds me back in 2013 when we actually used to have a e-commerce meta search business in Japan, and we ended up in selling to Yahoo Japan. And one of the big reasons behind that is actually the uh, e-commerce space back then has been really consolidated in Japan. And um, so the idea is, so if there is a, only a, one or two big e-commerce players in the market, Amazon and Rakuten, specifically in Japan, what's the point for the users to go to the meta search, right? You just have to do the two clicks, one to the Amazon and another to the uh, Rakuten. What's the point of a meta search again? So the, to me, I think it's a meta search is actually kind of a becoming less relevant to the users. And in a way, especially in the accommodation space, maybe the flight <laughs> space is a little bit different. Accommodation space, you know, look at the you know, global market, booking holdings, Expedia, Airbnb, and then perhaps a trip.com, but, and, then, and then that's it, pretty much. And the, uh, in Japan, during the course of pandemic, Rakuten Travel, Recruit Japan, and the EQ, those three guys definitely gaining a, a significant market shares. And then the people just to go to those websites, bypassing you know, uh, us and even Google. OK, so, so let's get, uh, Pete, let's get a, some agreement, a yes or a no from, from the rest of them on whether they agree that the days of meta search, uh, meta search is broken in this age of consolidation. Well, we've already taken our decision on that. All right. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa? I have to go meta. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I believe, you know, meta search is, you know, broken. It's broken? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Especially on mobile. All right. Exactly. That's Mine. a good point. Yeah, mobile. Our, yep. our growth in audience and app downloads would suggest it's not broken. All right. <laughs> do I get to do some soul searching, Suhoon? Yes. So I, as I was uh, soul searching early on in the pandemic, I, I think I was, Kay was most concerned about is, is meta search broken. I was most concerned about is travel broken. And really early on in the pandemic, our, our consumer research showed us that travel is core to consumer. They, they, they yearn for travel. And we found that out early on. So I was motivated by that, Suhoon, as we started to see recovery relatively early on in the US market. So I, I shifted from soul searching to what can we do to move this industry forward. So all right, enough, enough about soul searching here. <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, let's get to the heart of the discussion. Uh, Renu, so Hopper has done well in, in, in the North America market, uh, right. number one in, in the App Store. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are your plans for Asia? Cool. That's probably a big question that the audience wants to, uh, to understand. Thank you for asking this. So uh, first, as a context, um, uh, international user contributes less than 3% of our sales last year, but this year, uh, so far, we already re the number already reached over 20%. Um, so yes, we are quickly uh, internationalizing, right? So uh, in terms of what uh, values we can bring to APEC market, um, there are actually many three um, levers, uh, which actually are consistent with Hopper Global um, business strategies. Uh, the first lever is uh, most competitive uh, pricing, right? So. Uh, custom obsession uh, and uh, uh, lower prices are uh, two of uh, Hopper values, okay? Nobody didn't like cheap prices, um, and which is still uh, one of the best drivers for booking conversion, I think, right? So uh, Hopper is determined not to charge our user any hidden uh, fees and, and try to provide the most transparent um, and um, competitive prices of those travel services uh, to our customers. Uh, then. Uh, people might ask, how do you make money, right? So I think this brings up our second lever, which is fintech services. So Hopper have been famous uh, for uh, our you know, very unique fintech solutions, which is high margin, you know, and designed and developed to address uh, travelers' uh, anxiety about uncertainty in booking and the travel processes, right? So, um, and with those kind of uh, uh, fintech services, we are able to uh, provide unique values and margin uh, to our business portfolio. Uh, and uh, we actually continue uh, to develop new product, uh, fintech products to our app. Um, 
which actually you know uh, is uh, tailored uh, based on uh, customer needs. Okay, so uh, the third level will be our travel um, super app experiences. Uh, super app is have, have been actually popular and prevalent in Asia for quite a while, um, but not so much in OTA business, right? So um, Hopper actually have been learning a lot from uh, those Asian super apps like Pinduoduo, um, Shopee, and Grab. Uh, some of you might notice, you know, our, our CEO Fred had, you know, expressed obsession with Pinduoduo's uh, uh, user growth model uh, in multiple occasions. Right, so we are uh, endeavoring um, to um, I provide uh, leverage, actually uh, leverage social commerce, uh, gamification, and loyalty programs um, to provide the best travel super app experiences to our customers across all verticals. Right, okay. so you so you're bringing uh, uh, the U.S. playbook that you've been developing to to the APAC, and it'd be interesting to see whether that playbook works in APAC, where we have much more advanced super apps and much more, but it could work in your favor in that consumers are actually much more open to, to super apps. Yeah. I'm gonna go to Mike there, you know, and, um, you know, Mike, uh, I mean, Skyscanner's been in APAC a long time, uh, Garrus was here uh, very early on at WIT, right, and so, I saw you kind of nodding when Reno was uh, speaking, but were there points where you disagreed with him and say, mm, uh, you know, what, what advice would you give Reno as a Western brand entering APAC? Yeah, I think the, the, the main bit of advice I would give Reno is, is, um, is localization. It, it's, it's absolutely fundamental to success in, in, in APAC. Um, even from my own personal perspective, I, I, I was based in the Singapore office for Skyscanner for two years just before the pandemic. And for me, it was, uh, it was really eye-opening, the, 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 the uh, the difference in cultures between the Asian countries. It's, you know, I guess in my naivety, I thought it was gonna be a, a bit more homogenous, like it is in Europe. Um, so for me, that was a real eye opener. But, you know, localization can be anything. It can be, it can be pricing, it can be uh, how you format a date, it can be, if you look at India, coupons are prevalent. If you look at Korea, payment models are prevalent. So, you know, in a nutshell, it's localization. That's okay. the most critical thing. Cool. So, localization. Um, there's also non-travel players that are local within each market. So Lisa, I'm interested, um, a big question I think the industry ask, is asking are, are these non-traditional travel companies, are they a friend or are they a foe? They, they have the potential of being either. From where I'm standing, they're actually a friend, but that is uh, that has a lot to do with... Uh, you trying to sell them services, right? E-travelized business model and the fact that we actually thrive through our partnerships. Right. right? So for us, it's a friend and you know, we're here for anyone who'd like to um, uh, uh, have you know, the best and cheapest flights. So, so let's trigger the audience uh, poll and, and maybe get the audience to answer as well. And I know for, for Alok, you know, this is like a, you know, a, a old question, right? We, we've answered this in Asia, but you know, for other markets, this is still very relevant. So I put in Cobra there because that's kind of the hidden enemy, right? You don't really see it, but it's there, right? So, so let's see what the audience uh, answers to that. So, so Alok, I mean, uh, like Hopper, you also offer... Uh, embedded finance products, right? And right. so people using fintech to cover for, for travel and you've got free cancellation protection. You just went live with Isigo Flex, which is a fully flexible ticket with yeah. zero rescheduling fees, right? Yeah. So, so how is fintech or embedded finance playing an important yeah. role in so the world of OTAs? I think it's really to do with customer expectations. The previous panel talked about how, you know, customer expectations are evolving and I think when customers go to uh, you know an e-commerce app, buy something they don't like it, they get an instant refund, and you know no questions asked, guarantees. Uh, that experience historically didn't exist in travel, right? Like we would have uh, all these TNCs hidden in the lowest possible font somewhere at the bottom of the ticket, right? Which nobody ever read. And then when you go to modify or cancel, you would have you know all these hidden surprises, and at times you would get back pennies. Um, and I think. Somewhere as an industry, you know, especially during COVID where a lot of people struggled with, with cancellation, refunds, uh, reschedules, uh, I, I think the focus for the consumer shifted back to predictability, right? We're in a space where availability keeps changing, prices keep changing all the time. If there is a way we can make the experience a little more predictable, uh, there are people out there willing to, you know, uh, obviously pay a premium for that, right? So uh, it just boils on that theme. These products are doing quite well for us, um, and you know we are doubling down, uh, you know, assured 
is now a two and a half year old product. Flex just launched like less than a month back, uh, but seems to be uh, doing okay. So um, yeah, I, I think Hopper's the, uh, definitely the poster boy for, for embedded FinTech, but uh, you know, there's a lot to learn in it for everyone. When do you start looking like a FinTech company and a non-travel company? I think at the core, we're just a travel company uh, that's trying to improve the customer experience with FinTech. That's the way we look at it. Yeah. Okay. If, if so I could just add one thing, though, I think it's very interesting because the type of products we now call FinTech that, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are marketing so fantastically well have actually been around for quite some time. What's really changing is the customer behavior and the way that people want to consume those types of products. I mean, they've been around for 20 years. We have been offering them for, for at least 10 plus years. But the spin is different. It's more a glass half full type of approach than a glass half empty. Are you sure you don't want to check out without purchasing these 10 things? <laughs> right, maybe it's about you know, the right message at the right time to the right sentiment at that moment, right? You know. And, and in, in our think tank last night, we talked a lot about the importance of putting the customer first. And I think that's something that we've heard throughout the day today. Right. Um, and, and maybe we can reflect on some of the challenges um, that we've not yet cracked in flight search. So I think that's something as we're looking into this new world and looking for new experiences. Maybe Kay, share some perspective on what are some of those problems that we haven't solved yet when it comes to flight search? Well, I think, uh, um, um, to me, I think it's the uh, um, flight search is actually is something that, uh, you know, to be very honest, I think it's, I feel like, you know, if I use a Google flight search, that does it all, right? So, and the, but the point is actually, so if I book, I always find the uh, specific flight numbers and then, and then go to the uh, airline's website. And then, so there's come a disconnection there you know, in a whole user experience, I think it's, you know, there's no seamless experiences for me at least. And then uh, that is something wrong. I think it's, you know, that no one has been able to actually kind of uh, crack this uh, problem. So it, it's interesting too, because we're seeing Google move away from assisted search. And so that goes a little bit counter to that, that point, because it still isn't seamless going from a, a meta search directly to an airline site. Uh, in many cases, it's, it's a, a difficult uh, conversion. Maybe you can share, Mike, a little bit about what you're doing on that front. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is a difficult, you know, there is some friction there for sure. Um, but I guess, you know, mobile, I think it's about 75%, more or less, three quarters of our traffic is now on mobile or, or app. Um, so a significant proportion. So it's something that we're very, very focused on. As, as airlines websites uh, continue to become better mobile optimized, that really does help as well. Um, I mean, in terms of, in terms of Google, <coughs> Excuse me. What, what what they do is 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 everything. Um, what what travel companies do is 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 travel. Um, and I think you know, as 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 airlines continue to invest in their in their mobile platforms, that that does reduce that friction. How about you, uh, Reno? Any problems that we haven't yet solved in 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 flight search that maybe are opportunities as as we move ahead? Well, uh, actually, Google actually brings out a lot of values uh, in flight search. More like you know transparency of the content to the user, right? But to us, you know, uh, not not just that, you know, other than the uh, transparency of the um, the content, how you still kind of like you know maintain this uh, sustainable, healthy business uh, while making money, right? So this is why we develop those fintech services. You, I look. Yeah. I mean, so um, you know, I, I I think search. You know, there's still a lot of. Uh, you know, like there's enough innovation out there already where the industry actually needs to work on the flight side is the post-booking experience. We are one of the youngest OTAs in our country and market, but we've realized that nobody solved so many problems that seem so obvious, right? Like the customers are struggling with uh, reschedules. Uh, we still need to talk to somebody on the phone for so many things. Just changing, just changing one letter in your name because you typed it incorrectly it's a pain nobody in the industry has actually solved, right? You can't automate these things even sitting in 2022 and we've been talking about it for 20 years. So I think somewhere uh, post-booking experience and uh, across you know, OTA, Meta, whatever your platform is, 
is an area that, uh, that, that all of us needs to, need to put more time and effort around. It's still, that's what the consumer is actually telling us is broken. All right, so, so tell us how you are solving that uh, right. using voice bots in India. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, we started the journey with uh, Tara, which we actually launched at the Focusrite launch event in 2017. And uh, now Tara is uh, fairly evolved. 86% uh, plus of our customer support queries are resolved end to end without human intervention. So it gives a lot of operating leverage in terms of uh, not having to throw more people into a call center. Um, and I think uh, the learning from that is uh, the state of the art there is where you know, your call center can be fully automated with AI. I think we are, uh, people believe we are decades away, but I think we are like probably two or three years away from, uh, not, a, not just as a company, but as an industry, where that can also, uh, you know, be so, so uh, uh, I, I think pass the Turing test essentially, right? I mean, it has to be, a, 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 it has to be in a way where you can't tell whether it's a bot or a human. Uh, and I think we've started to take some baby steps. So a lot of the input fields now on Xigo, you, know, you can actually uh, say out things instead of actually, uh, um, you know, uh, experiencing with the keyboard. Uh, we also have voice guided screens now where you actually have some kind of voice assistance. Uh, but we're still working on the end game, which is to have some way to allow uh, a voice based interaction without actually a human on the other side for the low lying. Uh, things, right, which are easy to solve. So fu fully, auto fully yeah. automated. So Pete, shall we talk about customer acquisition? Because that is a big thing, right? I mean, you know, talking about relevance of flight search in this world, but customer acquisition is getting way more, more, more expensive. Don't yeah, it's, it, it, it's true. Lisa, maybe you can, you can jump in here. So other than SEO and SEM, because we know that's you know, that's, uh, as Suhun mentioned, getting really expensive. What are other things that flight search companies can do to, to grow traffic? I mean, we ourselves have uh, traditionally been a meta search um, driven uh, uh, online travel agency. Um, that's our bread and butter. But a few years back, we took a strategic decision to actually offer um, our full inventory and ancillaries and services um, to uh, big uh, consumer household brands, and how, uh, and that's how our partnership with uh, Booking.com came along uh, to the eventual agreement uh, to be acquired. Um, and this is basically um, has been a slight pivot uh, to our traditional model in selling through Meta and being based on price comparison. And we see that there's slightly different attributes that people will care for when they purchase through price comparison versus uh, a large consumer brand. Uh, uh, that's also uh, quite interesting, but it's still a cheaper way to do uh, traffic <coughs> acquisition uh, than simply playing on content and just scaling SEM. Um, even though I have to say, um, in the past um, few months or let's say, year plus, it seems like the SEM space is decluttering a bit to what it had been before for uh, 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 quite a number of, uh, of years. So, so maybe briefly the other panelists can just share one brief idea on customer acquisition post-pandemic, like one thing that really, really worked well for you post-pandemic. Let's start with Mike, very briefly. Uh, yeah, I'd probably look at the, the results of the poll there for where um, yeah. a, lot of people, a lot of people consider non-travel apps as friends. I, in a previous life in Skyscanner, I used to run our um, B2B business. Um, we have agreements with Huawei, with Samsung, um, with, with you know, a whole host of non-travel apps. And that's a, that's a fantastic way of, of generating um, uh, viable okay. traffic uh, and, and customers. Reno? Yeah, uh, speaking of user acquisition, I think uh, Hopper, uh, the model is very unique because uh, we are mobile focused, right? So uh, we kind of own our, uh, our social media and the social uh, in-app social commerce features to acquire our users. And also at the same time, we use push notifications to engage them and build a relationship with the user in terms of like uh, the retention and conversion, et cetera, et cetera. Reno, you how, much, how, mu how much does uh, Hopper spend on, on Google? Can you, can you tell the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, well, more specifically, we spend zero on Google AdWords. 
but of course we still spend uh, spend some dollars on some you know Google like YouTube or just uh, ASO etc cetera, etc cetera, because it's like uh, for app specific marketing do you find that the methods like one big difference between customer acquisition in Asia as you come into APAC and what you've learned in the US is there one big difference is there a stark difference to be honest you know uh, even in the U.S., uh, our, our app actually ca uh, cr uh, caters to those uh, millennial and Gen Z, uh, and younger generations in America actually they uh, they using um, they're using the mobile devices uh, more like Asian customers, right? The Asian, Asian users. So okay. that said, you know um, they actually uh, they check uh, their apps before search on Google, right? So um, in speaking of that, I don't see big difference in terms of like uh, just younger generations. Uh, when you actually use the mobile, uh, mobile specific apps. Okay, so it's less about age. So, so maybe we come to K then, because chat is huge in Asia and speaking about, you know, and, and you did a partnership with Line to launch travel.jp for business on their chat platform, right? How is that progressing as business travel recovers in Japan? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question because, you know, first, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in, in a context where like, Japan has been very slow, as everybody knows, as, yeah. in, as the primary, the borders opening up and everything, but, um, um, one thing happening very positively is the uh, uh, business travel is, is finally coming back, and the, uh, um, we are um, we are really actually uh, um, getting on a wave of this recovery, and the uh, um, um, so our business is is a very unique because we don't have a website, so all we have is the chat interface. And the, uh, we just communicate with the uh, business travelers uh, using a Slack kind of platform. You know, um, there's a line version of uh, Slack. And the, uh, uh, so we just communicate with the, uh, with the users, and then we book everything on a chat. And, the, uh, and then it's been very promising. And first of all, the users love this interface. Because you know they 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 basically use this same uh, you know like Slack like platform like 24/7, and the uh, so they can ask it, ask us anything and then you know we just do it uh, um, 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 very timely, and the uh, um, and in July so we already passed the uh, uh, number of booking um, um, exceeding uh, in all-time high in the pre pre-pandemic, so um, um, we. Also, love to actually see the higher margin comparing to the meta search business. To be honest, so so it really excites me. And then you know we feel like uh, you know this is going to be like a, a game changer uh, in going uh, going forward, even in outside of Japan. I think. And Kay, what's the demographic of your uh, of your audience? So so this is a business travel business. So the you know so the uh, it is not the B two C business. So uh, typically, you know, our clients like uh, uh, tech companies, like uh, Yahoo Japan or Line, you know, or, and, uh, or but at some, you know, small medium enterprises, yeah. they're like a, a little bit like a more traditional side, but, uh, but those people even using the Slack these days, right? So, um, um, but younger generations, you know, younger uh, business drivers typically love this experience because, you know, it, 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 everything is so fast. Right. And comparing to like emails or phone calls, right? It's, it's like a new age corporate booking tool for, and, and it's they, what they're familiar with, right? Rather than pushing into another interface. Yeah. Okay. So back down to this end. So um, to maybe to, to Reno and, and Mike. So for obviously the flight business is fairly lean margin, highly regulated. Um, what can OTAs do to cultivate user stickiness as we talked about before, Google is moving away from assisted booking. Um, and honestly, how do you think Google's helped and evolved the flight search game since 20, 2011? Maybe, Mike, we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, so Google certainly made its, made its impact on the market. And we see that particularly in, in, uh, in North America. Um, I guess we, we, have a, we have a relentless focus on customer service and, 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 um, and putting the traveler first. It's a, it's a key tenant in everything that we do. Um, that, that, that for us is a, is, is a fundamental differentiator in, in, in how we, uh, and how we create that stickiness within, within our, our, um, our platform. The other thing is, I suppose, is responding to what the traveler wants. So Skyscanner was historically a pure price comparison. Um, and price was quite easy to compare. 
Um, but you know, that's kind of evolving now. But what we're also seeing is th through the pandemic, we became a far more useful or more broadly useful product because we introduced the COVID map, which helped travelers understand where they could, uh, where they could travel and what restrictions were and, and you know, really assisted that. So it wasn't price comparison. It was moving up the funnel to that sort of assisted um, place. And additionally, you know, our, our, our biggest search term um, with over a third of our search terms is, is our Explore Anywhere functionality. So that's people who have made a commitment to travel. They have budget and they have time, but they don't know where they're going to go. So that's over a third of our 93 million travelers that are, are every month are looking for inspiration, which ties back into where we're moving um, quite, quite quickly now into our partnerships with DMOs because it's a huge opportunity to influence the traveler at that point of indecision. Okay. And you're also sharing, um, sharing data with your partners. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that part of your, of your business and how you're advising partners on search trends and booking trends? Absolutely, yeah. So we have, we have a number of products in our business that, that, that basically encapsulate the, all of the data insights that we get from our, 90, our 93 million unique visitors a month. Um, it's billions, literally billions of, of search terms that we see. So we do get um, fantastic demand uh, visibility. So we're able to see future trends. Um, People that enjoy that, airlines use it to, to identify unserved routes. Um, airports use it to help influence airlines in their negotiations. Um, and then there's also um, non-traditional um, non or non-travel players that, that, that ingest our data as well, such as hedge funds and so on. Well, uh, so it's a really broad, broad suite of, uh, of use cases. I guess it seems like you know, everybody's trying to extend their revenue streams, right? I mean, like, clearly, flight is not enough. Uh, we, we understand from him that it may be broken. It has very low margin, so everybody is kind of like just extend the, as, as much of the revenue streams as possible. And to Alok's case, right, you know, multimodal search has still not been solved, right? In, in a way. And you've tried to. You've uh, acquired the train ticketing platform. Uh, conf and you've, you've also uh, acquired a bus ticketing platform as well. Right. So really, you, you're looking at multimodal. Yeah, so I, I mean, um, before the pandemic, you know, we were already a very large train utility business that had just become a train ticketing business. In fact, we became OTA first on the train side because we realized that a uh, very large portion of reserve train book, uh, <coughs> bookings uh, could potentially come through us because we already were most downloaded uh, train information app in India by the time we pivoted to OTA. Uh, on, and, and we saw that there was huge synergy with the flight side because if you think about the demographic from tier two, three, four cities in India, that's where the rising per capita income are allowing them to make that quantum transition from taking trains to taking flights. We thought it'll be great to be at the fringe of that and kind of enable that, right? And we've seen the benefit of that through the pandemic as our flight business bounced back very rapidly uh, and, and of course, bus is a very obvious substitute for train in India, and in some cases, reaching the last mile is impossible without buses. Um, and now if you go in our train app and you do a search on trains, you can see in two tabs at the top, you know, in parallel searches from the nearby airport and nearby uh, bus boarding points. You know, these kind of things are driving more cross-sell, upsell, but also the plan is to have, you know, obviously much more multimodal uh, uh, availability surface up. Yeah, there. especially especially when, uh, you know, we're talking about sustainable travel options, right? And people are saying, well, you know, where, where you don't have to fly, maybe take the rail. I mean, that seems to be happening in Europe. Pete, do you want to add? Sorry. One, yeah. one quick mm -hmm. point to add on, on a diversification of so, uh, verticals. Yeah. And the, uh, so um, what we are very excited about is actually the short-term rental space. And the, uh, so this is kind of beyond the meta search, the traditional meta search, because you know, the products are not standardized as a hotel. So, and the, <clears throat> so this content approach we are taking, it really works well. So for example, like we published the article, like a top 10 uh, 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 vacation rentals with a private swimming pool in Seminyaku Valley or somewhere. And then this kind of articles actually really works out well. And the, uh, so we've been able to grow uh, nonstop during the pandemic, L like the Airbnb actually grew very nicely. So our business has grown like, uh, you know, 3.7x in the two years, in the last two years. And the, uh, uh, we are reaching like $100 million of, you know, gross margin merchandise booking uh, annually now. And uh, it's really promising. So this, this, this short-term rentals. And then the best news is actually that market is actually not really here yet in APAC. I think it's, that's actually the next big coming. So, 
So content-led customer acquisition in a specific sector, a fragmented sector like short-term rentals. Yep. So, okay, we got five minutes, uh, Pete, so we got to wrap it up. Maybe you could go with the last three questions. So let's talk a little bit about subscriptions. Lisa, uh, you know, we're talking about extending models. Yay or nay to subscriptions? And we go with the audience poll as well. I think we got an audience poll on that. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I have to go with nay. I mean, um, nay? Okay. Uh, yeah. What it about has to you? Do with the yes or nay? Nature of the yes business. or no? Yes. 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 No. No. Okay. Two, two three, no's, three, three yeses yes. and all that. And let's see what the audience says. Okay. Right. You know, we, I think we've been talking, and Lisa, we, we spoke last night about it too. It's like, has flight search been really innovative? I mean, we still, still to me, talking about small increments, right? So, very quickly to each of you, very. What's been the most innovative thing in flight search in the last five years, the past? Um, I think it's a, a um, um, it, non-GDS, maybe. OK, non-GDS. I, I think the ancillary and the cross-sell upsell funnel has improved a lot. OK, Lisa? Creating ever more complicated itineraries. Okay. Our data-driven fintech services. Intact, okay. The ability for travelers to understand the carbon impact of their travel. Okay. Pete? How about the, the next five years? Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah. Yeah. So, anything else, Kay? I think uh, the, the blockchain technology, that, that definitely excites me, like how, how to implement, because it's the, um, you know, the blockchains and airline distributions, I think it's a really good marriage you know, so um, um, a smart contract, a idea of smart contract okay. really cuts, fits in well. I mean, right now, I think there are a lot of restrictions, a lot of uh, frictions in the airlines, you know, the distribution. I think it's the blockchain has a tremendous opportunity to serve this. Okay. I, I think it's uh, also going to be about how we balance the tech with the human element, like customers. I mean, we can't mindlessly throw customers at bots uh, and expect them to <laughs> feel that they have great customer experience unless the bots are really good. Um, but in many cases, you know, people are just removing all ways to reach you know, a human. Um, and we'll have to find a balance for that because um, you know, that's also leading to frustration from a small subset already. So I, I think striking that balance of uh, and that's an AI problem, by the way, figuring out if your bot is failing is an AI problem. Um, but essentially, finding out how you can seamlessly transition that cohort into a real human that's available and doesn't put you on the phone for 10 minutes, I think okay. that's something post-booking we need to solve for. I'd say, moving forward, we probably need to think of flights as being really the ancillary and the prerequisite for selling other sort of uh, products, whether it's in fintech, whether it's uh, buy now, pay later. There's, there's a lot of things that we're going to see in that space, not just uh, uh, in terms of um, um, uh, ancillary products, but in terms of insurance and also changing the payment cycle of, of the industry. To me, uh, I will vo actually vote uh, like fly search enablement embedded in short videos. Because these days, like, uh, TikTok is so prevalent across the globe. Everybody, I assume most of here, uh, people here actually spend a lot of time on those uh, short videos on a daily basis. So you probably get like, more exposure to this kind of you know, fly search uh, occasions. Short you know. form videos, uh, mm. search using short form videos. Right. Um, probably machine learning, um, AI enabled personalization of search. I think that would be a big thing. Um, and potentially, I agree with Alok that you, know, you can't replace a human with a, with, with a bit of technology, but I think technology will continue to uh, drive um, customer service as well, those two things. Should we finish with some word associations? Yeah, soon? <laughs> absolutely. All right, Lisa, you start off. Hopper. Fantastic marketing. <laughs> Ixigo. Trains and buses. I think I love those great niches. Thank you. Yeah. Renew Skyscanner. Uh, price comparison. Uh, look, travel.jp. I, I think resurgent and with great potential, uh, you know, and good luck with the meta OTA decision. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike, e travel I. Resourceful. They always find a way to win on meta. You guys are so polite. So polite. <laughs> what association? Uh, Pete. Pete Como. 
For, new, for, <laughs> for, for me. Yes. <laughs> new. I've never met Pete before. So. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for co-moderating this panel with me, Pete. Thank you, Mike, Reno, Lisa, Alok, and Kay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.